Yeah. Welcome everybody. Standing room only. Look at this. I know. Oh, yeah. That's great visual. <laughs> I think we need some chairs. Okay. okay. I know. I know you all were like, you know, hoping to catch maybe like a ninety minute nap this afternoon. <laughs> Just enjoying that big lunch. Did anybody get a slider or just a pile of French fries? <laughs> <laughs> First in lunch or last in lunch. So, so yeah, even though you, you may have been looking forward to listening to me and or Lisa drone on for 90 minutes, that's not going to be the case. This is going to be an interactive session. So I don't know about your perspective in healthcare, but if it, things are changing and continue to change, um, and then you know, depending on your particular facility, your particular situation, how you go about managing your hospital operations and therefore your hospital operations cost is different, right? So there's there's no pat answer to the question that's up on the board right now. And what I'd really like to do is engage this group in a conversation, kind of talk through what you're seeing, what you're feeling. We've got some pop stars up here, of course, to kind of lead and guide the conversation. Really, we want to uh, get your your perspectives and uh, we all learn from each other. And to help facilitate that, since I can't pass around wine to duplicate the conversation, <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to be bribing you with some fantastic gifts. So we've got uh, we've got Yeti mugs and we've got uh, Yeti water bottles. And uh, for, for the Apple people in the crowd, I mean, we are. You know, we are in Apple country here, right? So if you have an Android, please just kind of, you know, <laughs> stalk it under the table right now. But, uh, yeah, if you are an Apple person, you have fast chargers. So Jamie and Sasha in the back are going to be randomly handing out some uh, some of those those giftables as a joke in the session. But for the folks who participate. So that's my bride. Um, so, so, yeah, Jeff and Lisa. Uh, I've been with Crawfold since August, so I'm not even coming up on a year. Prior to that, I spent 34 years with GE. I left GE, I was leading our multi vendor service business, so hopefully that helps bring some perspective both from the OEM side of things as well as that multi vendor uh, ISO side of the fence. Uh, very happy to be here and presenting with Lisa. I'm Lisa Fry. I've been with Crawford for eight years this year. Um, prior to that, I was with GE for almost 20 years. So, been in the imaging world, I've been in the world for a long time now, 30 years now. So, we're excited to be here. We're going to tell you a little bit, just real quick, because this is just to kind of tell you how to optimize your cost and, and how to have a good program, but a little bit about our company and where we're from. So, we work for Crawford Healthcare. I don't know how many people in here have heard of Crawford, but you know, we pretty much take care of all support services within the hospital. We team up with Morrison Healthcare, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that here in healthcare, they usually take care of a lot of food services. And so they're also a part of um, Crawford Compass. So we put those two together and become Compass One Healthcare so that we can come up to a hospital system. And we stay specialized within our service units. So all service lines have people that are uh, specific to those service lines and know those service lines. To run them so we don't kind of don't mess with that and keep it very specialized. But we un we're unified and come together as Compass One Healthcare so that we can go out and buy all services, all support services for a hospital, take care of everything else and have everything. And we're a market leader in a growing industry. We have about 2,300 plus healthcare clients out there in the US. As you can see at the bottom here, we have a lot of awards from a lot of different. Modern healthcare, best places to work in 2020. So tough year, I'm sure everybody knows that's a hard thing to get. Um, best places to work in Pennsylvania are headquarters for crop in Pennsylvania. So we um, tend to um, get that one every year, which is good. Uh, big market up there. Um, best place to best employer for women. So it's great for me. I love that. It's a good company to work in. So just a little bit to tell you about crop and then. Yeah, we didn't want to do too much on that because this is more talk about how to optimize your service delivery. So, so we are in our room. We'd like to make this interactive, like Jeff said, so we could go around the room and just kind of understand what you guys and where you're from and what you participate in in regards to are you an aging provider or are you a service provider or a 
and that way we can kind of know who you are and what you're looking to take away from this session. Yeah. Uh, Richard Gonzalez, the uh, president of College of Biological Technology and uh, the Imaging Center and the Educational Services Center. Any takeaway from the other class? Death proof is the same college that actually knows. Okay. Actually, you know, no matter what, so no. <laughs> Go ahead. Sharing more for certain technologies. Uh, we're an IT provider of uh, streamlined business processes inside of medical facilities. So, we're Dave Delaire with uh, Astrochair Acoustic Labs. Uh, we're an ultrasound uh, third party um, repair company. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly curious with where Crawl is going to take. Uh, how to, how to optimize their operations. Uh, very selfish perspective. Pat <laughs> Malka, <laughs> I am the chief manager of Four Seasons Medical Center, which is a small community hospital in the area, and a pat and optimizer. PJ Pangerlock, I'm the director of clinical engineering here at Green Valley in Adam. She wants to be doing more on operations. <laughs> Perfect. Sharon Chalkis, uh, Director of Procurement for Crawl. Hey, I'm Brian Mullins of the Procurement I'm not in the head, but I'm here to learn something. That's awesome. <laughs> Afternoon, Mike Martin. I'm from the Marvel West region, so I'm here all day. We've got a whole team here. We've got lots of support. I'm a Capro and Program Development for Crawl Healthcare. And <clears throat> today, is, this is my dosage of learning uh, something. Maybe Alicia, I'm also with Crawl and uh, for the the heck of a sense of that here, so I don't know how much you know what Jack knows as well. Shock for Jimmy Nelson, Philadelphia, right? Oh, I'm Jim Cheek, I'm the president of the Pro Office. I'm the engineering business, and I'm a jet, so I'm really Hi, I'm um, Nicole from Metro Systems Director for Nana Emerson in Healthcare, and I'm interested because my budget is way down the drain. Mm -hmm. so. Harold, you're a uh, managing energy shop or UCSF, and you provide more acquisitions of that. I'd like to see the service cycle. Robert Chunk with Radiology Planning, we're a design construction firm specializing in. Radiology, nuclear medicine, and radiation. Dave Iseldijk, I lead marketing and product management for Glassbeam. Uh, we're focused in enabling healthcare technology managers and, and uh, imaging and independent service organizations with proactive and react, um, proactive and predictive alerts. I am Susie Reese. I'm the vice president of the cell for the same company that David works for, and um, I'm interested in. I'm Andy Wheeler with Conti. Uh, I was going to give Lisa some props since Jeff seems to be the one, but I know these two are both a lot of knowledge, so it's important. Uh, operations uh, as a grouping. So we should join it, Andy. You've got extensive background in the space. Mm -hmm. So feel free to join okay. in. Can you share it? I'm okay. David Software Channel. Center, CSNFL, Bay Area, Radiology, Corbin, across the system. I work with Doug back there. I'm trying to figure out how we can marry our departments closer and closer. How do we optimize? So, just one word to walk. Do we need to keep you guys separated? Is there a no, I think we can. 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 I
Yeah. If you're throwing anything at David up here, just give me a second. He's asking. So, Brian, kick off. I like Jeff said, we want to keep this interactive, but we got people back there willing to give this swag for people participating. All right, so here gives a quick uh, snapshot of our, our agenda. So we're going to take a quick peek at the market. Again, hopefully we've got some different perspectives on that. What drives the cost for, for imaging and imaging service? What are some strategies to address that? We'll talk through some frequently asked questions and it says on the Q&A. So that's going to be kind of as we go throughout. So, so from a market perspective, you probably recognize these numbers or some numbers that are similar to this. This came from sources like the Trump, Trump Commission, G, right? But kind of highlighting that this market is large and it's growing by leaps and bounds. Um, and, and then we're constrained by labor shortages. And on the bottom, we're talking about a big acute issue with regards to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. So from that, that market perspective, we're, we're seeing this amazing growth in imaging. Uh, I told you I um, spent 34 years at GE. I, I worked with some of the guys who were like the original MR and CT engineers. But that, I mean, that technology is as old as the gray hair on top of my head, right? So um, a, a lot of industries are seeing this baby boomer wave, they're seeing this, this turnover. <clears throat> but, in, but in the healthcare imaging space, we're literally seeing some of the pioneers of this industry retiring out of the industry. So, on top of, on top of COVID, on top of 2.1x medical device growth, so there's a lot of pressure on this industry. And I think we're all feeling it, right? We're feeling it clinically, and we're also feeling it from, from a service perspective. Traveling nurses, I remember that being part of my vernacular prior to COVID, but now it's, it's uh, becoming rampant. And same thing, I was talking to some folks this morning uh, about cross the services we offer. A very frequent question was, do you offer a template? Because the, the, the labor constraints are just everywhere across this industry. So um, consistent with what you're seeing, feeling, I mean, yeah, there's many surprises up there. Um, Cybersecurity, we're not going to go super deep into that today. I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't address it. Um, a, lot, a lot of the imaging equipment, because it's 510K certified, right? The, the operating systems and the software that they run on likely obsolete before that equipment is even released to market. So, you know. I was joking about iPhones earlier, but my iPhone is getting updated all the time for cybersecurity threats. And yet, for medical equipment, sure, once in a while there's a patch that comes through, but it is completely off cycle compared to what we're seeing in the consumer market. So it really raises the bar as an imaging provider, as an imaging provider, how to do protect against that threat because the device is not going to be managed by the open network like a consumer device would be. So I can see. That's not that's that's part of the space that you have that separate cybersecurity strategy around the IoT devices like that. So a lot of them are having their hardware. Absolutely. So yeah, you you have to completely section them off from the network and consider them to be broken devices. But one thing I'm not right now. But at the same time, you have the network for remote. Yeah, the diagnosis is there's still on the but they're sectioned off their own size the way the network so you can isolate that trial. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we're not going to go super deep on that. Did want, did want to mention it. It is part of our service offering. We're going to talk more about the fundamental uh, operating cost of the equipment itself. A um, little, little bit more on the market side of things. So 40% of the hospitals outsource medical equipment maintenance. From my perspective, that's growing. There's a, there's a trend towards thin sourcing. Um, so there's a 40% outsource, 60% in house. Um, there, there are a number of different competitors that offer different services and capabilities. All OEM, go um, all independent third party. Rothel is kind of in that middle space where we um, tend to work with a hospital customer and build what walks and talks more like an in-house program 
people on site for quicker response. So a lot of different models out there. Um, and of course, cost savings, right? So it, it, it used to be that physicians made the call on a lot of this stuff. It wasn't so long ago, prior to the Deficit Reduction Act in particular. And now more and more, you see business people leaving hospitals, not physicians. You see CFOs making decisions around equipment and around service. So it's all that cost pressure from all the reimbursement cuts that are really impacting this market. Another look at trends. So this 2009, 2014, 2019, the expertise has always been important, continues to be extremely important. But you know, there's there's the data that backs up those statements around the cost savings and avoidance, right? There's just skyrocketed and change of hospitals looking for cost savings. And of course, the pandemic didn't help that. You know, out of the game, a lot of hospitals felt that cost pressure. Um, and I think, I think the, the willingness for hospitals to consider non OEM service, if they were traditionally OEM service, a lot of hospitals who had been locked into that OEM service, that paradigm kind of broke. So we're really trying to look at what, what alternatives do we have. Is yeah. it, Question. Yep. So I, I do agree that you know the pandemic certainly caused us to focus on our models more, and I have certainly wanted to bring in third parties, but I still see this hesitation. Well, what if uh, you know we end up going down longer? You know, this is a new company that we're trying. So what are some of the things that you could get, especially that last part there, finding the right company? How do you get the organization to take that leap of faith as opposed to yeah, I know we should be doing this, but you know we've been with the OEMs for so long. What's what's the push factor for the organization? Ooh, that, that's a great question, and we're, we're going to delve into that deeper as we go through. But this is a great preview because the, the way I kind of think about it is that the OEMs are very good at airlifting in the entire infrastructure. So when when you sign up for OEM service. Um, your sales organization is going to be geared towards replacing your equipment with their equipment. They're going to have the ability to um, escalate and bring in experts if need be. They can go back to engineering teams to design the equipment to resolve your issue. So they, they, they airlift in that infrastructure, but it's not particularly flexible. And, and one example I'll give you because it brings up downtime. Uh, I know mentioned that. Um, when I left GE, I was leading our multi vendor service business. Prior to that, I was leading our global supply chain for all the parts. And the, the, surprising, the surprising reality is that my multi vendor supply chain, which has, as part of the multi vendor business, was carved out and uh, independent from the GE OEM supply chain. My multi vendor supply chain had better parts fulfillment, significantly better parts fulfillment than our OEM parts business. And there's, and there's reasons for that. The, the OEMs are generally sole sourced and apart um, because of you know, regulatory requirements back to the FDA. They, it's very difficult for them to deviate. So even if that part is available in the third party market, they, their quality systems may not allow them to go and get it. So when their when their sole source dedicated supply for stumbles core as the equipment gets older, it gets more and more difficult to procure that part from their vendor. Their supply chain starts to size. In the um, independent space or in the multi vendor space, there's a lot of options. Andy's here representing Avante. They're one of, one of our partners, and they go out in the third party market you know, multiple sources for that part. And if Andy doesn't have the part, then he's likely to refer me to someone who does. So um, although the OEMs can bring in that, that overarching infrastructure, you, you start to see the weaknesses of it, um, particularly as your equipment ages out, they, they really use that, the robustness that they have at product launch. Does that, does that help to answer your question? 
And of course, there's a lot more nuance to this, but we're going to keep talking through your specific questions. KPIs, I mean, there's lots of things that we spend basically hard to drive that fast. So, can I ask a question just because of the question that they asked? So, in your place of, you know, how do you manage? Are they all going to the majority of them, well, yes, they're all they're so third party. We're looking at um, mm -hmm. phasing those out, but even in the discussion, you can see the hesitation. You know, we want to, but then it's like, ah, oh, no, let's just continue with the OEM. Okay, so one of the one of the things that people say, uh, so let me ask you your contracts. If you have a major vendor there, have you had problems with getting parts? Because we have seen by our experience, like Jeff mentioned. Whatever it has a lot more resources than the OBM, yeah, sometimes you will have OBM sales the only the only part where a um, manufacturer says, I don't have a part, it's going to come three days later, nobody says anything. So it's almost assumed that they are the default, so we can't do it. So it's, the other side is not look at where a multi vendor can get you parts in a quicker. And we experience it. We, we do experience because there are certain customers of ours will have OBM contracts. Will manage for them when they have a problem getting parts, they are concerned that they manufacture parts. Well, one thing we're definitely lacking is um, vendor competency. So, nobody's Perfect. really tracking how many explains, what is the downtime. It's just kind of, you know, because we're so busy in short time, things just happen. True. But with, you know, I've been there a year, I'm trying to implement some of these things as well to help us either exit contracts or get better service. So, <clears throat> It's all falling in tandem with the contracts coming to expire and paying how much more money we can save. So hopefully the next few years. But I can I can see the hesitation, you know, and it's the same thing I was previously in Guam, and they would not even want to consider any other third party unless they were local, but it is just not an option because you're so scared. If something happened in the past the last time we did this, then this is what happened. And they take that past experience and Make a future performance. So. I do understand that. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, can I, can I just make a comment? So it's very important cultural transition that you talked about. You'll see in a few moments, Jeff has some, some of the tools that we use. Just picture those because we own that transition. We understand system directors, director of radiology, and you know, all, all of the leaders, senior leaders at least, of your buyer. They have all the constituents, so we help with that transformation. Well, and, and specifically, right, helping with that transformation, these mentioned data. So, so something that um, you know, I, I, I personally endorse would be bringing in a provider that manages all your contracts, I mean, all our under ODM contract, and that has a CMMS that is able to to track. Service call response time, service call frequency. So you're starting to get a cohesive picture of what's really happening in your system. And as those contracts expire, you can make a decision about whether to continue that OEM service or whether to go a different route with it. So, um, but, but, but you know, to your point, having the data, where can you make decisions without data? Sometimes it's easier to bring in third party an umbrella for your service operation than is driving. Um, you know, fight for the funding to grow yourself. And I'll, okay. I'll say one other thing because I know that uh, oftentimes the OEMs are seen as a premium product, right? So they're, you know, we're going to pay more, but we're going to get the best, right? And what we've seen is is a trend where they're not retaining necessarily the best staff, and they're they're actually letting those folks go because they're doing their own cost cutting measures. And so who you get is not necessarily the most capable, even though you've got this uh, premium product mentality. In fact, you're getting probably a much greener uh, engineer coming in uh, who's just picking up the phone and calling the OEM support. So that, that's, a, that's a, a misconception in today's world, I think, as well. I'd like to say, too, with the, uh, one of the things we're doing, Taking advantage of their purchasing power. Even though they'll go to this OEM and they'll get part they get such a high discount uh, because it's because of the amount of data. So even me, as a, you know, I've got a contract, I've got experience in savings, but still going to be huge savings by going to some of the right, like thousand twos to get right in my contract. 
So I think we're hearing some of these concerns yeah. coming out on many, right? That, that's a top concern. So cost, people, um, safety, finding those industry experts, regulatory compliance, focus on patient care. Um, in, in, you know, in recent years, there's been a, a huge debate between the OEMs and the independent service organizations, the, the OEMs lobbying the, the FDA um, for, for greater regulation of the independent service organizations. And re really what that what that has turned into is that the independent service organizations really decide things themselves, primarily through ISO, so ISO 1385, same standards that the OEMs are held to. If you read, if you read the FDA regulations and the CFRs, right, there's a lot of room for interpretation. So um, ISO 1385 really makes that much more specific and actionable, even for the OEMs. And so this whole debate has been started with the uh, OEMs going after the FDA. So the ISO is simply self-regulated, implemented ISO 1345. And now you have industry that's on a much more level playing field. You're seeing the next steps of that too, um, with things like the OPAC, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So some of the OEMs have been very aggressive at locking out access to their equipment. The, the FDA and the CFR, CFR 21, of course, which requires OEMs to put up service access on their equipment. It's called AI18. Um, but some, some OEMs voluntarily disregard that regulation. As far as I know, there's never been any OEMs prosecuted for non-compliance. So, there, so there's a mixed bag of how the OEMs view that. And then you see some of them now coming in and where they were previously providing access, shutting off access, reinterpreting some of the guidance um, in ways that previously was not interpreted. So you, so you see, you, know, you see the OEMs trying to squeeze tighter, and then you see the regulatory environment opening up. Um, like I said, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act basically saying that uh, third parties can access uh, systems that are being worked on. So I'm going down regulatory compliance by the whole. So this one is our participation part. You guys can do some more. See if there's, um, you know, I guess, what are your top concerns? You mentioned the financial one, obviously. Having a vendor that has a quality program. Um, any other concerns you're hearing out there within your companies or organizations? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is a big one. That is a big one. Um, what about trends? What type of trends are you seeing? Are you seeing hospitals go more towards ISOs or staying with OEMs, going in house? Like, what are you seeing out there? Are they doing a, a grouping of everything? Uh, so, we work in feeding with town of and our perspective, we're seeing our registrar, and we're so you can all work on the field, so we're going to get fed. All across the country, we heavily in the park, and we're going to get fed. We graduated on 225 to 255 a year. We haven't had a problem getting a camera. Not so much, you know, yeah. so, or in house. Because I, I thought those numbers were a little off with 60% in house and 40 percent outsource. That seems a little high on the in house. So maybe you guys agree with that. I mean, we're just kind of getting the numbers, but I think the independent service organizations are different. And I think they're hungry. Yeah. And I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but that's also you know, the, not getting what you expect necessarily from the OEMs. I think there's some truth to that too. So, so I, I personally encountered some folks that had previously worked for OEMs and <coughs> priced themselves out of their jobs and such. And that was something I said. I agree with that statement as well. And I'll have typically, you know, come from an OEM and I'll be in with the ISO um, 
you're you're an independent service organization that has the engineers that are there that are technically they troubleshoot more on the OEM side. They have a lot of support behind them, so they don't always they're not always your best technical okay. people. They got three or four different lights and people change the command and kind of hone in and tell them what the problem is. But when you're out in the ISO world, you've got maybe two lines, three lines, you know, different directions, but they usually become better technical. Okay, any other thoughts? Bring up here. The swag that you all guys, I'll see y'all in there. Have we got some good participation? I was going to say, I, I'm part of that. 34 years in GE as well, and I would I would say that, and I went independent, I so and, and now with the technology company. Um, I'd say the in-house was kind of high, but definitely the trend is toward in-house, toward ISO, because I think you know you guys are struggling with the cost and frustrated by the lack of transparency, um, which goes to your data point and flexibility. So I think that trends really going to continue and I, I hear a lot of customers kind of saying, you know, why is 98% standard? It's not the standard anywhere else, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't tolerate 98% in your banking or or just on any technology that you have. So they're asking those questions and I think that's good for the industry because it's challenging every aspect in terms of raising the bar because at the end of the day, you're the one that suffers from the IT staff, and it's absolute chaos. You know, so I, I think all those things are driving people to consider different options and pushing for a better standard of care for that. I just had a question. Has anybody ever challenged their OEM SLA? So, on remuneration and downtime? 100%. I challenge every day. Yeah. 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 We'll ask them about their in-house shared service programs that they have, but then I had a salesman tell me once because I've never had anybody ask that question, which was, what happens when you guys don't meet your 99%? What is it that you guys give us? Where is that discount? Do you can find this? Not a single one of them. Phyllis was the one that came closest to it, and they said, we'll at least go over and make you on a quarterly basis and we'll give you some overtime considerations. That's it. Yeah, so that's a, so that's one of the things that people know it's in that contract and they, and they want to talk about that. They're not accountable. They're not accountable. Then, you know, then they only have one engineer. You know, well, we know day well we got 35 x-ray systems in the Bay Area. And we're down for three days, you know, things like that. It makes it very challenging. Like that would be challenging. And that's what probably you you guys are experts at looking at the service level agreements and understanding how to navigate through downtime. If, if, if we're if, if we're managing um, existing going of contracts, that would actually um, help navigate through that. That would be more of our reviews. Yeah. yeah, so we don't, you know, as an independent service organization, I'm sure many of you come in and manage the whole program, even if you have outsourced contracts. So we have to, you know, they have to give us their own orders to put our system, track all those type of things, provide that information back to the client. They're pretty much guessing you probably will never track it to have a conversation on, right? So we do that for our clients every day. Can I give a simple example? Because this is something that you can independently look at contracts that are being managed by us. Our uh, director of imaging will say, hey, have you ever considered yourself when you're signing a contract with the OEM? Or uh, they normally give you a standard agreement, but if you actually push to get your uh, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., they will include it as long as you can bargain that part because otherwise you're paying bills immediately after 5 o'clock. They are giving, they are asking for POs. That's something that nobody automatically notices. You need people who can actually read that agreement and say, hey, here's where you can save some money. Where, you know, even if you have a OEM agreement. They, they buy it before the rest of the OEM. So, because if I don't know OEM agreement, I don't have anything to worry about. But that does not reduce your cost. It actually gets you, you know, things that you don't notice. So, something to say. It's great work, actually. It's, it's not all just about the price of the contract, right? It's about the scope of the contract. Okay, that's the way it's operating well. So, 
you know, basically we've all talked about it. There's there's about a handful of options when you're looking at how to run your that your house groups, that your OEM direct service contracts, your OEM multi-vendor, similar to the Jeff's background stations. Um, equipment insurance, I've heard of that out there so much, but I do believe there's going to be a resurgence of it with everything possible as I return to look about it later. Um, and then ISOs. So, you know, those are basically your options. And so many times people go in multi different directions. So, we're going to kind of talk through how to optimize your crop, your program, and have a quality cost effective program. Two more. So, you know, when you do, you got those five options. And if you, you have OEM contracts, you have some in house, and you have different OEM contracts in many different directions, then it's really hard to have all of these items, which is what you need to standardize your service delivery plan to run effectively. So, service delivery plan, if you're with, you have five different contracts, how can you manage that to have a standard service delivery plan? Each vendor's going to come in and get you their own. So, you know, and then the customized escalation procedures, they're all going to have their own. So then you, you don't have a standard, you know, hidden all your compliance, your regulatory, tracking your repair turnaround time. They don't, a lot of them have dashboards that you can go to to look at, but everybody's busy in the clinical world and they're not going to go look at those dashboards. They just want their equipment on. So, kind of what we're talking about is, you know, so many hospitals have a multi direction of the way they're going. It's, it's impossible to standardize this and you're, you can't standardize, you can't become efficient and cost effective. So, so this is just kind of a visual from Crawford's perspective. What you're kind of seeing across the middle is you know, the fundamentals of service delivery. So starting with your PM, periodic maintenance, and then going across into various levels of repairs, just for simplicity, we're calling it level one and level two, um, which are supported by tech support and logistics. So walking through that a little bit more slowly from, I think I, I stated at the outset, there's like different ways to look at service delivery plan, the in-house model versus um, the OEM model, which is typically a specialist model that's not site-based. Uh, so, so in our world, it is site-based. It does tend to have more of that in-house flavor. We would absolutely plan on doing everything that's in that dark blue circle, PMs, managing the parts, the level one repairs, and then getting into some of the level two repairs. But we, we do draw a line there, and we say that when we get into some of the more challenging repairs, we know that with an in-house team, it's going to be difficult to train everybody on every possible scenario, every piece of equipment that's in that hospital. So if we get into a very deep repair, like a specialized piece of equipment, we're going to be quick to bring in the OEM or to bring in a, a hardware vendor to help with that specific. So that's part of how we bridge that gap in terms of the size and the scope at a very low level. Um, and then also how we help to bridge that gap in in terms of just the skill gap that we're all experiencing right now. So rather than trying to be all things to all people, if you know, we focus on the majority of the service delivery, that day-in, that day, day-out day service delivery. And when we need help, we know where to get that help in order to make it a, a seamless service event. So that's that's how, how we look at it. Um, then from a, an on-site perspective, but for us, it's about that relationship. And I, I'm talking from a profit point of view right now, but I don't think it matters if I'm talking from an ISO service provider or if I'm an in-house service provider, we all have customers, right? So the radiology department, that's our customer. So doing that, that quarterly business review, having very clear KPIs so we can agree on expectations and how we're doing versus those expectations. Um, that, that's very primary, and then right next to that is the capital equipment side of things. Um, how are you planning for the future? Obviously, it's very expensive. We're going to talk a little bit later about options for that. The, the easy default is to go to the OEM and buy new equipment. It's the argument that, that may not uh, be the, the, the optimal solution, certainly not for every scenario. So, so, trying to, so there's the service piece of it, and then there's the, the program piece of it, that 
that relationship. And, and I guess just, you know, been building on that. But what's the reason for doing all that? Is to build that relationship because what do we know about it? One, it's going to break. And number two, you're occasionally going to have big issues that you have to work through, right? When I, you do have extended downtime on a piece of equipment. So how do you work together with your, your customer? So, how do you avoid finger pointing between OEM and ISO, particularly when it comes to warranty issues or, or things which, you know, the OEM will always seem to point to somebody else and the reason it broke was somebody else's problem? Yeah, great question. And number one, if it's a warranty issue, it's going to go straight back to the OEM. So, we would really be involved in a warranty issue. Um, but but to a, to a broader answer on that question, so like in the in the stream that I laid out there, we're not going to be bouncing back and forth between ourselves and the OEM. So if we agree to bring OEM in, uh, far away, that is going to be completed by the OEM, right? So I you know, again, speaking from experience, from a GE perspective, one of the ways that they, ways that they like to manage their service costs in the multi-vendor space would be to uh, bring in Siemens to help diagnose or perhaps to do a very limited part of the repair and then complete the rest of the repair themselves at a, at a lower cost. A lot of times they're able to pull that off and it works, but it leads to exactly what you're talking about where you can get some really ugly finger pointing discussions, right? right? So, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily as an approach, um, but yeah, it absolutely can happen. So, I'll just, I'll just back up right there. OEMs and ISOs. In the, in the previous slide, OEMs could not, would not be in the uh, ISOs at all. Today's world is different because everybody is going from OEMs to ISOs. So they are losing a chunk of the business. So they are willing to work with ISOs. In many circumstances, we actually work closely with them because we know that we need them and they know that they, they we need them. So I mean, they know that they need us. Okay, sorry. <laughs> It's getting older, so it's taking a while to get it right. But yeah, but we have to work together with the OEMs. It's it's not a it's not you know us against them. It's more collaborative today than it used to be before. Uh, in circumstances, we do need the OEMs to come in, so they understand that you bring them on time material. They have an understanding. They will not point fingers as long as they know that they're making money from us. Too. It's, right. it's it's all about the customer eventually, and the customer if they know that you're doing a good job for them. They will work with the OEMs in a similar manner, and they will make sure that there is an understanding that Grapple is your partner, or any ISO is your partner. So it all depends on how it looks. Typically, uh, like Jeff was saying, in level one and two, if we're in a, a hard situation on repair, um, we get to a certain level, we work with, we always do our bigger partners first, um, because obviously that's where we're able to keep your costs down. Um, but when we get to a point where we have to call that OEM, we're, we're done. We're not working on it anymore. We're bringing them in and they're taking over. So there's no, you know, they're going to bring their own parts and they're going to do their own thing. Because obviously they're not, there's a few scenarios where they might use our parts because they can't get them. That happened quite a bit. Um, but most of the time we've reached a point where we're stopping it and they're coming in and taking over to quit that back and forth. So how do you set up those benchmarks there? How do you accept it? So that's the KPIs and the escalation process. So those are all things that when you find a vendor or a direction you want to go, make sure that you have those laid out in that process as part of the contract. Lisa, I would ask a question. So if you just took the top off the book, your favorite MRI, we show that you put names to these stages, you see the charts are coming from a lot of times for the stock We show this before as a service event. Can we explain the SLA? KPIs were set up. This is for how our CMMS is going to read it. Electronics automatic CMMS is going to work exactly as it's set up. We just as customers see it right. So that so that's how we help customers that have conditions that weigh in. They're cautious about making changes. They see this it's a lot more settled. See it. What about the time and material delay so that happens with the OEMs when they're not giving the resources to you because you are TN? We don't have this way staff. You know, we're not pulling any guy. You know, you're looking at a delay there on site service area. What are you guys experiencing on those 
it can happen, but we have so many different avenues. So like, you know, Andy here from Avante, he's a big part of it. Well, I mean, when you end up and you have to go to that sort of solo event has gotten there. You know, obviously you've had your time, you've had your KPIs, you're really up against it. You know, now you're, now you're going into the Typically in those scenarios, and I've had it happen because they are short on staff, sure. on contracts, they have to bring out their people. So in those scenarios, we continue to troubleshoot it. A lot of times we'll get it fixed before they even get there because of that. And we make the client aware of it, waiting on the vendor to come here, but we're not going to quit working on it. But to continue, and in many cases, we get it up and running before they get there because of that. So it kind of works for our benefit. The, 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 the ideal situation is. Um, to, to a lot of this conversation is to open up that, that partnership between you as the ultimate customer and equipment owner, your, your service provider, and the, the equipment manufacturer. And if you know, all the OEMs have a vested interest in having that equipment be up and running because they want to sell you the next piece of equipment, right? For them, it's, for them, it's their reputation. So, so ideally, that's an ongoing conversation, not to mention the fact that get into uh, training and application support and other, other adjacencies. And when that conversation is customer-led, you have an enormous amount of power um, in, in, in terms of how that, how that OEM is going to respond to it. So I would, I would, I would encourage you know, going back to that relationship piece Really, really important. If, if, if there is no relationship and we're operating transactionally with the OEM, we can usually work through that. Well, it kind of goes right back to service only. Kind of. I mean, UCSF, I mean, they put those back on our case. So, okay, for the plant service events, you have to have the You think you give them plenty of time to see your So, they get to leave. So there's a day or there's a part of the account that gets us not yeah, those, regardless of the relationship you're trying to build there, sometimes you get into that, you know, get into that path where you're trying to call them down, trying to get that partnership. You know, you've got a verbal partnership, and you certainly have the sales team out there. Still a disconnect experience. The return is our, our, our experience has been that with the OEMs, um, when you talk about the fact that they're going to sort of hold you over the barrel just because you're TNM, that that mentality and that culture that they have doesn't stop just because you're TNM. And so once they think they have you, they think they have you, right? And so as you talked about with the SLAs, where they they've got these metrics, but they have no intent on how they're actually going to make good on it or do anything if you <laughs> if if it's otherwise. So you know the the, the OEM. Uh, expectation that they're going to have your business and whether or not they're going to provide uh, timely service really doesn't stop just for in my experience right. with TNM. Even contract customers experience the same thing. Yeah. That partnership does come in. Right? You know, ultimately, when you're selling the equipment, they want to keep that relationship going. So, also, there's a partnership with the client here to support. And I guess just one more thing to add here: the whole the whole contractual piece. So. And that's not so. I have contracts with all the major OEMs. So as, as much as we're friendlies, um, you know, and we, we compete like heck to win the service contract. But once it's awarded, there's it's understood there is a shared need keeping our customers. Happy. So. Okay, just a couple of key elements. So when you're looking for a service plan. Now, these are some things you want to make sure you're keeping an eye on to have a, an optimal quality and cost effective plan. Parts, new and repairs, and glassware options, making sure that you understand that. I know there's a lot of people saying it's either risk or not risk, but there's options out there with that. TNO service. I mean, there's, everybody's doing different things now. You know, national contracts, stocking depots, technical training, and we're going to hit on some of this um, on the following pages. So it's kind of you know, like we talked about earlier, the OEMs used to be the only ones that were ISO certified. Now, um, independent service organizations are getting ISO certified. So, majority of them out there are ISO 1345, which is holding them to the same standards that OEMs are providing like service that they put in. So, when you're, whether you're in house or you're looking for a vendor, you're going to want to make sure that, that these are things that they have to offer because you want a quality program. So, if you have an ISO certified company out there, 
by that service to you. Yeah, they're going to be making sure that they've got correct and you know, action plans. So things happen, they're going to make sure they have a system so that when it does happen, they're fixing that so that it doesn't happen. Tracking and fixing. You know, a comprehensive document control. So like our CMS system, this would be the case for everybody. If you got other contracts out there, we have one system that keeps that document for you. It keeps the tracking um, all the time and, you know, things like that so that you can hold them accountable for your SLAs and your KPIs and stuff like that. So having that comprehensive document control, also whenever you have a definition or somebody, you don't have to go and find different questions to try and get your documents to the rest of the um, a total training management program. So having a quality program in place, you have a system that's doing the tracking of your training for your quality programs. So and everybody's aware they can track everything that's in there. And then, you know, last but not least, customer feedback and tracking through resolution. You know, clients, things happen every day. Systems break, situations happen, fix it, move on. You know, in a quality management system, there has to be a tracking mechanism put in place to follow that through resolution to make sure it doesn't happen again. So all of these things help create a good quality program that long run is going to be more cost effective and efficient. Here we are back to the people side yeah. things again, right? So um, tech, tech support, no matter uh, you know, how your engineers are trained in the hospital or how our uh, service team is trained in your hospital, you're going to need that next level of tech support. So in my vernacular, that national digital support, um, all the way up to partner and vendor support. So when you're, when you're designing a program or signing up with a service provider, you want to understand how that works, how that is, and how accessible that tech support is. Uh, and I think Monty mentioned it earlier in terms of the massive influx of new talents in, into this space, right? So more and more we're going to be going to that uh, expert supported model, right? Where you're in the front lines and you need this next level of support. So understanding who that is and where it's coming from, really deep to uh, we're talking about escalation to the core, right? And, I manage those escalations, I manage downtime. A lot of that is simply having the expertise to work through. So, technical training, and we're all, like I said, there's, there's staffing issues. We don't have enough people out there. You can no longer go out and hire to fix a solution. So, we're all dealing with that now. And so, technical training is very important. Whoever you're partnering with, whether it be in house or outsource or a grouping of you're going to want to make sure that technical training is robust. You got you know different ways to go about that, but you're going to want to make sure they're an annual strategic plan in place. Um, best in class programs, you know, be with somebody that's getting programs from partners, that we have services that have great training programs in place. Monthly in service training, you want to make sure you're good people are training your own and then cross training mm -hmm. continuously because, um, like I said, we can't just go out and hire. For solving problems, but people aren't out there. So, we're having to do a kind of create a program and we're currently starting an operation program to kind of start building our own because we've all come to this conclusion that long through late, the tougher it's going to get, right? So, this is very important with whoever you partner with to make sure that they have a good technical training plan and development plan in place, whether you're in house or farm it out. And it doesn't just stop at the technician, it's the leader too. Every good team starts with a good leader. So if you're not continuously developing leaders, then you're going to have trouble, you're going to have trouble supporting your client with a good team. And you know, Jeff brought up a good um, quote today that I really like. Silver Street Wave is out there. And everybody in this industry knows that we're all getting to a point where in the next five to ten years, there's going to be a lot of people retiring, and we got to find the people to bring in and kind of replace them. And so. You gotta find the ones within your team on a technical side that want to become the good leaders of those technical. So the only way you can do that is for them to see that their leaders continuously get developed and grow in their and they want to hire to do that. So you gotta make sure you're with the vendor that's put that time in to do that. Okay, another audience participation here. So what key KPIs? I mean you guys know what KPIs are, right? 
I mean, with your clients, with your contracts you have in place, what's important to you? To your performance in the care? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uptime. Uptime? Is that everybody, like, is that the number one for everybody at the time? I like to know. Is that turnaround time? It's been nice to have in house. But, uh, you know, that changed our program a lot to have some in house. Have in house. So, so you guys have response time. Response time is really important. It, 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 there's stuff that we can't work on so that we get lost sometimes. We're so used to these guys being on site, or one of the other sites, that some of these other smaller vendors that we forget their own, their own contract obligation. So, up to nine, turnaround time, response time? We need to be able to communicate guy communication. We've really struggled with communication with some of the OEMs. Perfect. Okay. But for them not to communicate, they've got something that's going to be down longer than 24 hours. Just something wrong. You know, yeah, we've been able to talk about it. 100%. How do you track these things? We you can track these 100%. Uh, because yeah, we, we need that uh, being in house. It's nice, like I said, we can get personal. We can get up to the end. We got to be enough. You know, we can track those things. How fast can we? How fast can we get? So, and the uh, the department level being in house is where we is where we can track that. And maybe you know, maybe you know, instead of waiting that time, it's waiting for the person. You know, now the the expectation is an hour. The expectation is twenty. You know, don't see that happen. Then they reach out. Yeah. Making sure you have solid KPIs, then you have a uh, good escalation task. It is very important when you're setting up a relationship with them. And be able to track that so you can know when they're not missing, when they're not getting it versus the talent units. Obviously, they're not going to tell you. Right? So you have to have a mechanism in place to make sure you have someone tracking it too. Those are very important here for uh, quality program. The time of communication, it kind of reminds me, I, I uh, had a coaching opportunity with a newer leader, and this leader seemed to treat the job like a social network and almost exclusively use texting as a means to communicate, which is not a great way to build a relationship. It's not a great way to express empathy when something is down, right? So, so that, that was uh, kind, of, kind of an interesting learning moment for me in terms of I would just uh, see the right, various different styles. And that, that actually kind of ties into the leadership development. And actually, Mike back here uh, pioneered what we call critical device alerts. So, one of the things we do with customers is identify one of the critical devices might be the ETC team. So, it's a list of equipment that. Um, you know, to, to your point, you actually can measure communication, right? So we, we've got it actually in our quality system now that specifies how and when we communicate with the customer on critical down piece of equipment. Not to say you should, should communicate on everything, right? But make sure that for the critical, that um, we're looking at very, um, what I want to say, not very directive. Um, very intentional, very intentional reality. Right, so we're coming down the home stretch. Um, the, you know, the picture I'd like to, to paint here with, with this slide is that it's, it's real easy to get in, into this thought process where you, you issue an RFP and you're, you're simply comparing the cost, the cost of a contract, right? So X versus Y for the, for the cost of the contract. And my challenge is to open up that aperture a little bit and to, to think about some of the things that we've actually touched on in this discussion in terms of you know, what about your TNM labor? What about some of your consumables and accessories on the imaging side? What about the biomed side of your house? Different customers look at this differently. Some look at the entire program, this HDM program. Some break it up between the biomed side and the imaging side, right? Um, regardless of whether you look at it um, as, as separate programs or one programs, I would say from a cost and a strategy and a relationship perspective, right? The, the bigger the bigger you can open up that aperture, the better decisions you're going to make. If you're only looking 
that cost, or if you're only looking at um, discount levels, right? Going to be um, sub-optimizing for that decision. So, at least was talking about KPIs before. Um, we brought a lot of these up in our discussion, but you know, uptime, staffing, um, that's never been more important, right? Understanding what the, what the staffing plan is with everybody that you're working with. Um, talked about cybersecurity, the CMMS. So that, that may be asking a vendor to use your CMMS, or maybe asking the vendor to bring in CMMS, which may be some of your capital requirements, your investments. Clients is big. Um, and, and, then, and then looking at contracting and procurement costs, right? So um, if you're managing dozens of contracts with different OEMs and different suppliers, that doesn't count free. Who's managing all the service calls? Is that somebody internal that's doing that? Is following up on those service calls? Or perhaps are you not following up? Therefore, it's just open ended. Um, so, how is all that being managed? How would that look different with one service provider, comprehensive program versus individual? Um, and some of the better considerations. I won't read those because we've talked about a lot of those, but um, you know, how, is, how does that total picture look in addition to the contract? And it's, it's not just for service contract vendor, this could be for a parts vendor as well, because different parts vendors. Add on all sorts of different fees. Some are some are visible before you're placing the PO, some get tacked on after the fact. Um, so yeah, looking at that, that more comprehensive view that really gets you to that, that data-driven decision making. Then it takes a team. So um, the biometrics that you there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you want to work with them that provide all of that to make them more efficient, effective, and creative. So, having a you know, quality of the client program in place, data and analytics you know, to provide the information to help you make buying decisions, work decisions on how you want to use a particular vendor or a particular piece of equipment. Um, cybersecurity, we talked about that. You want to deal, you want to give it to a vendor that has a very robust cybersecurity program. And it's out there every day. Equipment and it's a lot of downtime, it's a lot of system issues. So you want to make sure whoever you choose has a good cybersecurity. Capital planning, I would say, in the independent service organization, for us, we have a very robust capital planning program. But my opinion, if you go with the OEM, and you're listening to their capital plan, they're just going to be hearing towards their equipment. That's what they're there for. They know when their equipment is the life and they start hearing towards the purchases of that. They're not really looking at what your clinical needs are, what your ROI needs to be. They're not looking at what your needs are in the local market. So, um, independent service organizations are pretty non biased to any of that. They really care less which piece of equipment they buy. They want to help understand what your needs are and get the right one. National Imaging Service, so I um, just said a couple times we have to have the questions that we go with um, that. Then the parts for Kim, that we're technical team is out there working on some of the pillars at a time, look at sourcing and looking for parts you want to be fixing equipment, so making sure that they have somebody there just doing that for them, making them more effective and so on. And then the life cycle management, you want to work with somebody that can help you. Great. So somebody that's going to be there throughout the whole process, not calling in different vendors along the way, which is why I call some kind of process. And what's the process? All right. So again, kind of wrapping this up a bit in terms of different service strategies: in-house, OEM direct, OEM multi-vendor, like so multi-vendor. Filling your own colors based on your program and your program needs. One thing we can probably all agree on is that the OEMs are going to be your highest cost. So you're looking at this from a, from a price perspective, probably going to be different alternatives to consider. Um, you know, another risk would be strategic vendor and OEM relationships. So considering how house program versus um, an ISO program. I work together with some of those partnerships and the parts. When we talk about parts and generalities, there's parts specific to parts. Um, 
it's, it's very common for an OEM to specify a repair part as something that's easy to swap out, right? So a workstation computer comes to mind, or in some cases, it could be as large as an entire imagery con cabinet to a particular OEM that can't replace the board. They expect to replace a $3,000 cabinet. Um, that's a bit of an extreme example, but even with the workstation example, from that sort of delivery perspective, the OEMs have having trouble getting that workstation. Uh, so it's not constrained that same way, like the video card, it's not strong. So, so service the parts delivery really has multiple aspects in terms of specific part, which is the ability to go to a lower level part. Um, that's what helps keep your cost down too, because they're not having to replace the whole thing, they can just replace some video work instead of the assembly, which I think that's why the OEM's cost is a little higher because they can't go down that so how do you guys could be in a ball program or something like that kind of service break? So how do you can give all like the ball program out there? That would seem as called the middle set the same thing. But they actually come in with upgrade systems independently as part of the service contract. Do you have advocates for that? So we have partner vendors that they work with or something like that right now as a logic. Yeah, they're trying to upgrade old systems, and so obviously they go to the client and they try to upgrade their system, get them lots of new enhancements that comes with the cost, um, and we can work with our partner vendors to do those upgrades and keep that cost down. There are lots of options out there. I mean, the third party, I'm not a creature. Right. So, well, they didn't think we're going to see for you or something, you know, just something that, you know, that's, that's, that's all we're doing. Right. They're, 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 it would be fun to run the software yeah. to serve within. Yeah. You know, one thing to bring up is it's about the math. So if you do the math, the upfront savings, now you have the, your power to make the decision. But if you need to get to work on it, and then we've seen, you know, all the work, for example, that's what you have to launch. So we said, we're really all the work, we're really going to launch it. So all we got was one, and then we're on to another one. It's really the math. Doesn't serve you, yeah. especially if you didn't really. If you hold it, you always find you never would have passed by it. So, that's where I'm thinking of this as more clutter stuff. So, it's advantageous to have some by its partner to kind of lay that out for you to show you what the advantages to it are. Versus them, we're always in. And on the workstation side, Siemens will have a set of workstations that they purchase. They run out of their actors. So they have the incentive, whereas other avenues of big workstations is for a study. You know, other kind of partners do. The capital planning, and I'll see this up for time here, but um, you, know, you want to make sure you're with a partner that is non biased and is listening to what your needs are. And going out and doing the research and bringing things to the table that are advantageous to what you're looking for versus what they just want to replace because it's like the dry cycle. So it's very important to work with a vendor that has good capital planning program to provide to you so that you can do that value analysis and make the right decisions based on what you're looking for. It's always going to be uh, a more cost effective way to solicit it. And like I said earlier, working with a vendor that can help you from cradle to grave. So making sure you have a partner that can handle every step along the process and not having to use multiple different vendors during that process, which is not possible to do right So choosing that vendor that can help you get to the end, regardless of what the scenario is, whether it's bringing it in, you know, once it's installed on a vendor, take over the service to the party. I really help you provide the PMs here in warranty, so kind of taking that over so you're not paying extra for the back, handling the maintenance here in the maintenance life cycle, then getting rid of that for you at the end. You don't have to use OE to do that for you. Everybody has those capabilities out there. It just helps you to stick with one vendor to help you this process versus the um, so, so, yeah, you know, the cap equipment side of this. And you're looking at what to call this a new 
versus pre-owned, looking at a new piece of equipment, product release through you know, that, that OEM declares end of manufacturing or end of sort of support versus comparing that to an alternative through an independent, perhaps you're buying something that's a year or two from new, and then there's, there's no differentiation between it. Manufacturing service support, it's all just service support. Typically, that's going to be extended for the other manufacturers offering. Um, but the reality is, the OEMs have a limited number of platforms. So I'll compare it to a Chevrolet versus a GMC truck. It's really the same thing, but it's it's got different it's it, right? And it's sold, it's marketed as a different product, but under the skin, it's very similar. So the question is, do you need the latest and greatest? Technology? Are you scanning patients in the imaging center? Are you doing deep brain stimulation research? And really, really, really do need the latest and greatest. If you don't need the latest and greatest, if you're able to set and save on the, the acquisition of that equipment, that's great. But then you're also likely to save on, on the service cost, right? You're not going to be paying premium OEM service costs, not to mention, not, not, not going to be experiencing the downtime that's typically associated with brand new equipment. Again, I've seen from the OEM side where even at premium service prices, some of the newer equipment is serviced at a loss by, by the OEM. So that's the more than issues of that equipment. Experience that downtime, or is it worth considering something that is a couple of years old, potentially has a longer So something, something to consider that affects both the capital and so what do you guys think now about the thing you ever buy equipment? Are you always going to be? Pretty much. Yeah. Get success with it? Yeah, we've yeah, we gotten a slightly used up for most of the areas. We got in there for the percent, such as for the CRMs. That team. So we want to make sure that you know we want to get ten years out of something. So we want to make sure that we have technology to go back. We want to make sure that we're not getting XP that even if it went to seven, this has an upgrade back on those ten. Those things have to be checked off and we consider those. But we are in the middle and uh, and we're getting more and more into the piece looking into that and putting that into our thought considerations. But you know. That's how soon do you catch the time construction in this project? So that's good. So when you buy a piece of equipment, do you go to the OEM to service that, or do you have an LC? Well, that's a part of my philosophy right now. So five years of younger, so you find your start to see the high source of these guys when they get into training certifications, you can start bringing those in. So, you know, so yeah, we do consider that. You know, don't want extremely used. So we want that warranty period. We probably do a have our two-year service contract on our in-house team, and we let our sales catch up. And yeah, the sales catch up. So you have an in-house group of guys who help with your outsourcing. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts or ideas around this? Just curious about either one. How do you guys pay or provide a risk sharing? Has been around for better than a decade. How, how do you guys approach that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, around service? Around service, yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, I've heard various ones. Right? Yeah, yeah we have several programs. programs, I mean, problems anyways, that you can the water we're sharing with. You know, there's different two processes. There's um, EM Plus, everybody doesn't like to hear that, but that's kind of at the end of the day. So we're sharing on the front end. It's doing service at a cheaper rate to get a certain rate, to get a cap, and so it's first year with a cap. So there's many different models out there. And typically, I like to sit down and kind of understand what my seats are and try to come up with a solution. Get creative like that, where a lot of OEMs, they have standard processes that they have to use. They have their toolbox of items that they can use, and that's all they can do. We truly sit down and crack out a solution for a client based on their needs. I think we kind of covered these options right in terms of uh, house, OEM, like so. And, and so, so you know, once, once you do kind 
kind of choose a primary strategy, uh, I, I would argue that there's almost always going to be an opportunity to arbitrage that strategy. So you know, choose choose a primary strategy here. I have some in house OEM. You're using that as your primary strategy for service in your hospital. Then when you dig that second layer down, it's almost certainly going to be a situation where it makes sense to use an alternate strategy. Let's say this is in-house, there may be a particular CT that is known to have service issues. It makes sense to outsource that back to the area now. <laughs> um, and, and, and even if you're in-house, there, there may be certain pieces of equipment that makes sense to bring in a third party, maybe it's a specialized piece of equipment like uh, for ultrasound or your internet equipment. It makes sense to part of it. Or, or, even, or if you are part of the ISO, it may still make sense to outsource a piece of equipment to the ISO, or a certain piece of equipment in house, or maybe this is part of your in house transition where you're working with a partner to build, build your capability. So, so when, you, when you talk about strategy, I don't view this as a static or a one time decision. It's, 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 a, it's a living document that you're constantly refining based on. So, so yeah, just kind of coming back to the people on the communication side of this, right? No matter what path you go down, we all we all have customers, we all have clients, right? On the critical side of the house. So that collaboration is key. Um, coming up with a with a specialized approach, that partnership approach is key, especially when things go south. I mean that relationship can be really helpful. Um, and having standards that everybody agreed to. We, you know, our frame of reference, we call them KPIs, but having formal standards that all parties agree to. Um, and then making sure that you've got a support network, that you've, got, you've got partnerships, whether you're doing all your own in house service and you're dealing with partners just for parts, whether you're dealing with partners for support or some of your actual engineering service, just building out the setup. Aspects to that. Not a fan of those KPIs. Want to um, have full transparency. Want to make sure that you're able to go and look into the system and see it time versus them just telling you for a moment. So you want to make sure you partner with somebody that has a system that you dash for some sort of whatever you need to see real time numbers. You know, track those KPIs yourself. So you're not going on that. So I mean, formally, you know, if you look at the dashboard and show you how to get it close, but you want to be able to get in there and see it yourself. So I think it's very important to have transparency. You can also guarantee you should talk about what you're going to do to make sure you time to make sure those KPIs have guarantees back to them, that they're agreed upon as partnership. Well, yeah. well, at least it's going to be Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.